Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about um, how we can use deep learning to solve a variety of problems involving creative language. Um, but, and so by creative language here, I mean um, texts like novels and short stories, and as we'll see a little later on, also comic books. Um, but before I get into that, uh, I just wanted to briefly go over um, some standard NLP tasks uh, and how we apply deep learning models to them and sort of differentiate them from the problems that I'll be discussing later. So um, I will be using this example sentence. Uh, this is from Dracula by Bram Stoker. Uh, Arthur shall strike the blow that sets Lucy free. And so in, in deep learning, um, we encode uh, input text, uh, in this case a sentence, using a neural network into a uh, vector-based numerical representation. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail on um, how this encoding happens and what sorts of architectures we're using. Um, but for now, assume that we can just magically encode the sentence um, using a neural network. So now we can train this network to solve a variety of different tasks. Um, for example, here we could do things like NER, where I want to detect that Arthur and Lucy are people. Um, we could do uh, parsing, where I'm trying to extract dependencies between the words in the sentence, or translation, um, translate the sentence in English into German. Um, and finally, we can do things like question answering, where here, in a very simple case, uh, I ask who wrote this sentence as an additional input, and maybe the network has access to some external knowledge base as well, and it's able to uh, spit out the answer Bram Stoker. And so um, the key point I want to make with all of these tasks is while they um, have sort of uh, seen state-of-the-art results been set over the past few years with these deep learning models, um, they all uh, actually are trained on these more standard formulaic uh, data sources um, where there's usually available annotations. So things like news articles, broadcast news transcripts. Uh, for machine translation, we have um, political proceedings like Europarl, um, where our data comes from. And these things are really good for uh, sentence level tasks um, where we are interested in just uh, what's within a single sentence. But uh, in terms of the uh, amount of discourse context they contain and uh, how complicated this is, um, these, these domains are pretty limited. So um, to give an example, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, let's say we have this question. Uh, what does Lucy need to be freed from? Oh, sorry, was I blocking this thing the whole time? <laughs> uh, my bad. Um, so let's say we have this question, uh, what does Lucy need to be freed from? So here, obviously, I can't just answer this uh, question by looking at the sentence in isolation. Um, I actually need to understand the context. Um, and in this case, this context is the entire book of Dracula that precedes this sentence. And so what this means is to answer this question, I actually have to understand who is Arthur, who is Lucy, what is the nature of their relationship, and what is a series of events um, that led up to this point where Lucy actually needs to be freed from something. So you can see that this type of context is much more complicated than what you would find in a news article. Um, in particular, on the language side, we have things going on here like characters, um, their relationships between other characters, and how uh, these relationships grow or decline as different events happen in a narrative. Um, there's also a lot more inference required on the, the reader's point of, uh, from the reader. Um, if I give you a bunch of different scenes, how do I um, integrate these into a coherent storyline? Um, so these are sort of the challenges associated with these uh, huge, complicated discourse level contexts in creative language. Um, and if we want to begin to even try to solve or understand um, these uh, things like character and narrative using machine learning models, uh, we run into a few problems. Um, mainly, it's very hard to formalize a task like narrative understanding. How do I uh, collect data for this? How do I annotate? Um, what, sh what schema should I use? Um, it, it becomes very hard to formulate these, these problems in terms of your standard input-output uh, machine learning framework. Um, 
So what I'm going to be talking about here, um, uh, at least for a couple of the projects I'll be discussing, is uh, unsupervised learning approaches, where uh, we prioritize model interpretability over um, some performance on a downstream task. And uh, the reason for this is that we don't have any ground truth data. And so what we want is a model that we can look at its representations and be able to interpret them and map them back to some ground truth of uh, what we know about the original creative text. Um, so before I go on, uh, why should anyone care about creative language understanding? Um, so here I've listed uh, three different um, motivations. Uh, the first one is on the digital humanities side. Um, we have something called di distant reading in the digital humanities where um, basically research scholars turn to computers to make sense of large collections of uh, uh, things like novels. Um, which would take you know, a lot of time and effort for them to read manually, individually, one by one, to pick out some themes or examples of interest. Um, so having a computer that could possibly be able to help with this would uh, potentially dramatically speed up their uh, research workflow, um, the, their being humanities researchers. Uh, on the machine learning side, as I mentioned before, uh, the tasks we're looking at here are very different than um, standard NLP tasks, and we'll see how these tasks lend themselves to new model architectures. Um, and I'll talk about the human interaction component at the end of the talk. So here's an outline for uh, the rest of the talk. I'll be discussing these four projects, each of which touch on some subset of these challenges on both the language and the machine learning side. Um, so I wanted to start with a uh, case study, um, and it's going to be about uh, question answering. Um, so the purposes of this case study are twofold. First, I want to introduce uh, more concretely how the specifics behind these deep architectures and how they're used for NLP tasks um, to sort of frame the rest of the uh, talk. Um, and second, I want to provide an example, a concrete example of a task where if we had uh, some ability to understand creative language, um, it would improve our downstream performance on this question answering task. So, um, sorry, <laughs> this clicker is uh, acting up. So, uh, the, the question answering task we're looking at here is uh, called Quiz Bowl. Um, so, it's very similar to Jeopardy in that there's a moderator who's asking um, a bunch of contestants a question. And this question um, is uh, describing a famous entity, so like a famous author, book, battle, so on. And so we developed this uh, deep learning system called Quanta a few years ago to solve this problem and actually play the game of Quiz Bowl. Um, so before I get into the model, I just wanted to uh, ground the problem for you. So I have an example of a Quiz Bowl question here. So how this will work is I will read the question sentence by sentence to all of you. And if at any point while I'm reading it, anyone here knows what entity I'm describing, just raise your hand. And whoever answers correctly first uh, will win uh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay. Part of this book consists of a captain's log in which the captain reveals how his ship's crew disappeared one by one as they transported some boxes filled with earth. In this novel, the crazy Renfield eats birds while living in an insane asylum run by John Seward. This novel opens with a man's diary of his imprisoned, yes. Yeah, very good. <laughs> so I sort of foreshadowed this with my examples from before. Uh, but if you actually look at all of the clues here, you can see that the earlier ones are more obscure, um, whereas at the end, the last clue here, if you've heard of Dracula at all, um, you would be able to get this uh, question right. So um, the problem becomes not only how do we find the correct answer, but also when are we most confident enough in our answer to raise our hand and give a guess. Okay, so, uh, oh, okay. so uh, we look at this from the deep learning perspective here in this very simple diagram. Um, we take a question as input, encode it to a neural network, and have it predict the answer. So let's get into a little more details on how this encoding process actually works. How do we go from the text of the question into this uh, vector-based representation? 
So I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with uh, how we represent words in vector spaces. Uh, we use word embeddings, which are real valued low dimensional vectors uh, that tend to cluster around each other in the vector space uh, based on uh, meaning similarity. Um, <laughs> okay, so what we're interested in here, in here is um, not just how to learn single word embeddings, but also how do we compose uh, multiple embeddings that represent a phrase or a sentence or an entire quiz bowl question together into a single representation that we can then use for answer prediction. So if I have this phrase, this Bram Stoker novel and these four word embeddings, um, what I want is a neural network that uh, takes as input the sequence and combines them into a single vector that I can then do this prediction on. So I'll just go over uh, briefly the network that we actually use in our uh, current system. It's uh, super simple. We, we used a lot of more complicated architectures before we realized that it was all unnecessary and this is the, the one that works best and is the fastest to train. Um, so we call it the deep averaging network. Um, it's really uh, not complicated. So we take these four word embeddings and we just do an element-wise vector average. So we're losing all the word order information. Um, but as it turns out, this doesn't actually matter for the task. Um, and um, in order to make this a deep network, we, of course, need to have our multiple nonlinear layers. And so um, this happens with, uh, uh, so we can put basically as many of these nonlinearity, nonlinear transformations between the um, word embedding average and the uh, softmax classification layer um, as we want. Um, so it's a very simple model. Um, we've also obviously done things like recurrent neural networks and uh, convolutional neural networks, but it really doesn't end up making a difference uh, for this task. And I'll get back to why that is uh, a little bit later. So for now, though, I wanted to also mention that we found that this model outperforms a bunch of different QA systems on our task, um, including information retrieval type baselines, as well as just normal bag of words models. So we're treating this as a classification task. We have a set of 5,000 or so answers, and we know that maybe 90 or 95% of all questions are, can be answered with this uh, finite set. So our training data looks like 100,000 of these quiz bowl question answer pairs, um, just like the one I showed you. Um, so it turns out that high school students and college students write a whole bunch of these questions every weekend so they can play um, the game and we get access to all of these questions. So um, in addition to our uh, computer comparisons, we also uh, wanted to test against the best uh, quiz bowl players. So, in our first round, we played uh, Ken Jennings, who's the highest earning Jeopardy player of all time. So pretty good trivia player. Um, and we uh, actually at UW, we um, defeated him by a pretty large margin. So after this match, we were, uh, we were pretty confident. We were like, oh, well, Quiz Bowl is solved. Machines are better than humans. Uh, and the Quiz Bowl community didn't really uh, take too kindly to this. Um, they felt that Ken Jennings is not representative of the best uh, Quiz Bowl player, that Jeopardy and Quiz Bowl reward different types of knowledge. And so they said that, OK, why don't you play a team of four of the best actual Quiz Bowl players who are all college students? So we said, OK, um, there's no way you win. Uh, we beat Ken Jennings. Uh, but we actually got crushed um, by this team of four uh, Quiz Bowl players. And so we had to really reevaluate um, everything we said before. Um, and when we did our error analysis for this match, we found that we answered zero literature questions correctly, zero fine arts questions. All of our uh, points came on um, domains such as science or history. Um, and when we actually uh, went to try and understand why these like literature questions were so challenging, um, we uh, basically uncovered that our network was doing nothing more than memorizing named entities and mapping them to answers. So um, not too interesting. Um, if so, for example, we saw this clue earlier where we have these named entities like Renfield and John Seward. Um, and so once a network sees these named entities, it becomes very clear that the answer is Dracula. Oh, whoa, sorry. Uh, right. 
it becomes very clear that the um, answer here is Dracula. There, how many other books are there with uh, characters named both Renfield and John Seward? And so what is happening is that the network um, sees these super easy questions and does well on them. And these usually come later on in the question. Um, but it's totally unable to answer questions like this first one here, which contains no named entities. But not only that, it uh, doesn't really even contain any rare words. And so our bag of words assumption obviously fails here. We actually have to really understand what this uh, clue is saying. And not only that, we also have to understand, um, because this is an obscure plot point in, in Dracula, you wouldn't really find it in Wikipedia or a plot summary. So we have to also have some understanding of the raw source material of Dracula. Um, and so this sort of motivates, um, in this quiz bowl case, uh, models that actually are able to pull information out of the raw text of, uh, of these novels rather than looking at things like Wikipedia or, or even just existing uh, quiz bowl question answer pairs about Dracula. Um, yeah, so this uh, sort of leads into the next section of the talk, but I'll pause if there are any questions. Yeah, so in our human evaluations, we um, basically, whoever uh, buzzes, there's a buzzer, whoever buzzes first um, gets a chance to give a guess. And if that guess is correct, then their team gets all of the points. And the other team doesn't have a chance to answer. So uh, what was happening on these literature questions is not that the uh, network was unable to answer the question by the end. It was just that it wasn't able to answer it after seeing just one or two clues, whereas the humans were all capable of doing that. So they had presumably read the books before, so they had a lot more knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of questions. Sure. Um, when you're training the model, uh, you only train it on the entire uh, verse, or you train it on uh, parts? No, we train it. Uh, we have like. Um, yeah, so it depends. Um, for the earlier systems, we trained sentence by sentence. Um, but now we're training word by word. Um, so it helps with our, is that what you were asking? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. It's not. Um, so actually, the earlier clues see more signal than the later ones. It's just that the named entities become much more predictive than anything else. And we don't see as many named entities early on. So the other thing is, how do you decide when your, when your model is Yeah, that's right. I haven't talked about that at all. Um, but we have a couple different approaches. So in these. Uh, exhibition matches, it was just basically a threshold that we tuned to see, like, is it confident enough or not? But now, um, this is work that um, not me, but other people in the group are doing, is uh, working on reinforcement learning approaches to actually model your opponent, um, model their strengths in different categories, and decide uh, how aggressive you want to be based on that. Um, but that's still ongoing. It's not integrated into the uh, system yet. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I totally agree that that is present in creative language. And in all of the work that I'll be talking about later, we sort of just ignore <laughs> this because we don't really know how to handle it at the moment. So we focus on a higher level understanding. But yeah, I think um, even detecting when there is a metaphor is a challenge, let alone understanding what it's uh, talking about. But yeah. OK, great. So I'll move on then to the first part here on creative language understanding. Um, here we're trying to answer this question, uh, how can you describe a fictional relationship between two characters? And so one way you might think to do this is, uh, well, maybe all relationships are either positive or negative. We can just annotate a bunch of pairs of characters with 
positive or negative and train a classifier to do this. Um, but this, uh, this sort of ignores a lot of the complexities in real creative uh, relationships. So um, as an example, we can look at Arthur and Lucy again from uh, Dracula. So their relationship is uh, um, definitely not formulaic. They start out in love. They're about to get married. Um, so we may describe their relationship here by things like love or marriage or joy. But then Lucy is bit by Dracula, who's a vampire. So she falls ill. Um, she eventually dies, uh, but of course she's not actually dead. She turns into an evil vampire and starts attacking little kids and generally uh, doing a lot of damage to the surrounding towns. And at the end of their relationship, Arthur actually has to stake Lucy the vampire through the heart to murder her. So we can see that uh, positive negative doesn't, isn't really appropriate for a relationship as complex as this. And in general, this is true for most um, main relationships in, in novels. Um, they have a sort of trajectory that are, uh, it's affected by events that happen in the story. And so what we want is a model that uh, goes beyond this positive negative binary that also includes this uh, temporal context. So uh, concretely, um, what we want is uh, a model that learns these relationship states, so things like marriage and sickness and death as well as a trajectory, so an assignment of these states at each point in the relationship. So that's what we're going for here. And before I get into the data and the models, um, just a bit of motivation. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, humanities, digital humanities is a motivation for this line of research. Um, this question in particular has a lot of well-studied problems such as uh, did Jane Austen's protagonists have patterns in how their relationships develop, like did they start out hating each other and then eventually get married, um, it's a pretty reasonable hypothesis. Um, but there's also like more complicated questions we could ask like um, how does a subtext underlying a particular event uh, affect uh, future interactions, um, future relationship states, and so on, um, that we've actually been working with a professor at Maryland on, on this uh, latter problem here. Um, so there are many, many different questions that um, if we had a model like this, it could definitely help collect examples to either support or disprove any of these uh, hypotheses. Um, okay, so moving on to the data set, um, I'll try to be brief here. Uh, so we take about uh, 1,500 different novels, um, and we, for every pair of characters in this novel, extract all of the spans of text in the book in which they interact. So um, we define interaction by um, uh, having a mention. So here we have explicit mentions, but these could also be co-references um, to both of the characters. So this is the relationship between Ignatius and his mother, Mrs. Riley, in the book A Confederacy of Dunces. So you can see here in the span of text, there's an explicit mention to both Ignatius and Mrs. Riley. So we extract all of the spans of text uh, in the book, which contains these mentions. Um, and then we define the relationship as the sequence of these uh, spans of text. Um, so what we want is to learn a trajectory over the sequence, and we also want to learn the relationship states globally shared across all relationships in our data set. Um, so we have about 20,000 unique relationships um, and 400,000 or so of these spins in our, in our data set. So now we can get to our model. Um, so the model is called the Relationship Modeling Network, um, or RMN, um, and in principle it's a recurrent autoencoder that uses dictionary learning to reconstruct its inputs. So I'll sort of unpack what each term here means um, to be more clear, and we'll start with the dictionary learning part. So in dictionary learning, um, applied to this uh, task, what I want is to learn this matrix where each row of the matrix corresponds to a different relationship state. So here I would have the first row, maybe it corresponds to violence, the second row corresponds to sadness, and so on. Um, so obviously we're not predefining these states beforehand, um, and I'll, I'll get to how we actually go about interpreting each of these rows a little bit later, but this is the expected outcome. We want a matrix where each row corresponds to a state. And not only that, but for at every span in a relationship, we want an assignment of these states. So for example, here, Ignatius and his mother are um, sort of showing affection to each other in a weird way. Um, and so we may want the love state to be highly weighted here, whereas the violent state um, should have a low weight. So this is the sort of thing that we want the model to learn. 
Um, the recurrent aspect comes in because we don't just have a single spin. Um, we have an entire sequence of spins that describe this relationship. And so basically, this recurrence happens across uh, the spins. Um, and what it allows us to do is uh, basically focus on, um, so uh, it, it acts as a smoothing tool, basically. So if we don't have this recurrence um, and our initial models didn't have it, what tends to happen is that um, we get these very choppy uh, relationship trajectories where uh, Ignatius and his mother may be 70% in love at time step t, but then they may be 0% in love at t plus 1 if, for example, they're having a meal or doing something else, which, uh, it, which gets a really high weight in this case. Um, so by having this, yeah. Sorry, just quick question. Sure. Are columns are um, words or, or time step? I, I, I lost track of what are the columns mean? You said the rows are states, the columns are. Oh, uh, so the, the columns aren't interpretable in, in any way. Um, it's just the rows that, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how we can interpret, yeah. Um, right, so we use a recurrence uh, to basically smooth these trajectories to make the changes more gradual, um, which we find is, uh, is sort of like adding a prior to our model, that we want the relationship trajectories to look a certain way. And finally, um, our, uh, obviously we don't have any training data here. We don't know that at uh, page 32, Arthur and Lucy are 79.2% in love. Um, so we use an unsupervised uh, learning framework here where we're basically trying to reconstruct these spans at each time step using a linear combination of the rows in our dictionary matrix. So I'll go into a little more detail about how this works by just looking at a single time step. Um, so the first step, as in the quiz bowl case, is we need to encode our uh, input text somehow. And just like in that case, we, uh, we go with the word embedding average here. Um, we also tried things like LSTMs. But again, we didn't really see any improvement here, um, which, uh, which uh, sort of makes sense once you see the results of our, uh, our model. So we have our word embedding average. The next step is to combine this with some global information. So we learn these global embeddings about the characters. For example, we may want to model that Ignatius is rude regardless of who he's talking to. Um, and uh, this could be encoded in this global um, embedding for Ignatius. Um, OK, so we have these global embeddings. We combine them with the word embedding average at that span. And now we get to our recurrent connection. And so I just wanted to highlight here, this is the part where um, we're basically smoothing our relationship trajectory. Um, and our, oh, uh, our nonlinearity here is a softmax function, which um, essentially takes any input and uh, vector-based input and squeezes it into a probability distribution. Um, so it's all positive, uh, and all the elements of the vector sum to 1. And so what we want is to be able to use this hidden representation here as uh, the weights for the rows in our dictionary matrix. Um, specifically, if the vector on the left here is uh, my hidden representation, um, because I've applied the softmax function to it, now I can treat it as uh, basically probabilities for each row in this matrix. And so now if I do a weighted average of these rows using the uh, probabil probabilities as weights, I get a single vector, um, okay, this isn't working, which I um, basically am trying to make as close to my input word embedding average vector as possible. Um, and so we do this using a max margin objective function. Um, so this, this model only works um, because we fix our word embeddings to pre-trained embeddings and don't train them at all. Um, and the reason for this is if we do train them, then we get this sort of degenerate solution where everything can just go to zero and trivially minimize our, our objective function. Um, but actually using the pre-trained word embeddings gives us a lot of, um, uh, a lot of power that um, we get a lot of information that's not present in our data set. And this helps us when we're looking at interpreting these states. So yeah. Yeah, that's right. But these these change. Um, these these are learned by the model. But yes, this is fixed throughout the training process. Right. So, uh, what do you mean? Right. So, so you start off with the, the different word embeddings. Right. 
Oh, before, uh, I see. Yeah, we haven't looked at that. Um, but so for, for these spins, I've showed you the full spin here, but we toss out things like stop words and really high frequency words. Um, so what we uh, end up with are words that are maybe more descriptive of a relationship than um, if you would include all these normal words in, which would pollute your word embedding average. So um, yeah, I guess because this model sort of works, um, that makes it seem like uh, spans with uh, similar um, meanings are closer to each other in the word average space. Yeah. Yeah, so we don't specify anything about these embeddings other than, um, so we just initialize them randomly, and then whenever we see a relationship that includes Ignatius, we plug in the Ignatius embedding into this layer. Um, no, no, it's not pre-trained. So then after training, we can actually go ahead and cluster these uh, learned character embeddings, and we see pretty interesting clusters like, um, there's one for uh, female protagonists of romance novels all tend to have similar uh, character embeddings and like Tom Clancy novel protagonists are like up here in the vector space. So things like that we can, yeah. No, we just used a simple word average. Um, we didn't try anything. We, it might help, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we could definitely try things like this. But. Yeah, that's a good question. So we experiment with a bunch of, this is basically like a topic model where you have to pick the number of topics beforehand. Here we try uh, 10, 30, and 50. And we generally find that the more states you use, the more interesting states you learn. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so um, that's how the model works. And now what I haven't talked about at all is how do we actually interpret the rows of our dictionary matrix. Um, so this here is uh, maybe a sort of simplified version of our existing word embedding space. So we have a bunch of words that are in this uh, two-dimensional space here. Um, and so now, uh, because of the way our model is set up, uh, if I want to interpret the first row of my dictionary matrix, uh, I'll represent it with this green dot here. Let's say that I plot it in the same vector space and it falls over there. So its nearest neighbors are guns, grenades, and bullets. Um, so I can do this for all of the rows in my uh, matrix. Oh, sorry. And so now I have this nearest neighbors list for each row here. Um, so now, just like in a topic model where I get these topic word matrices uh, for each topic, uh, here I get these nearest neighbor lists. And so um, after training, I take my nearest neighbor lists and manually label them with um, whatever the theme of the uh, state is. Um, so this is just like how we label topics in a topic model. Uh, we also tried things like just using the um, closest word to each row as the label, but um, for our uh, experiments, um, we, we basically evaluated this with uh, crowdsourced experiments, and so um, it makes a big difference um, if, if you manually label them versus using um, an automatic procedure. But you can see here that the themes are generally um, uh, fairly obvious from the nearest neighbor lists. Okay, so now, um, like I mentioned, this is very similar to how a topic model operates. Um, so we can actually compare these uh, states to that of a topic model. So I'll just give you some qualitative results. Um, we see on top the relationship modeling network, and so I'm, I wanna make uh, two observations here. The bottom one is a topic model. Um, first is that with our, our RMN model, we get a lot of, uh, sort of low frequency words that are interesting, but they, um, a, as like very uh, close nearest neighbors to these rows. So things like regretful and rueful, you would never expect to be the most probable words in a topic model. You can see down here that um, all of these words are fairly frequent and less um, interesting if you want to uh, say that. Um, and what this actually means is that we can uh, learn a lot of uh, fine-grained distinctions with our RMN model. So in a model we train with 50 states, we learn a couple of different types of love, like one for romantic love, one for family love. Um, and 
We see uh, some examples of these emotional states here. Things like sadness and love are judged highly coherent by uh, crowdsourced workers, whereas the uh, topic model tends to focus on these more concrete um, uh, events-based things, food, uh, violence, outdoors, and so on. So um, uh, the fact that our model is able to learn these emotional relationship states is um, it just makes it more useful in, in terms of that humanities motivation that I was talking about before. Yeah? Again, this is, so what's in the model that kind of biases it towards learning these emotional states? Yeah, so nothing in the model biases it to, to that other than the fact that we, um, we have a penalty. So if we just train this model um, as I've described, uh, it, it tends to learn a lot of duplicate states. Um, so it may learn like five different sadness states. So we add a penalty after observing this where we discourage the rows to be, um, basically make them as dissimilar from each other as possible. Um, and so I think this uh, sort of helps with learning a diverse a set of states. Um, uh, so the topic model, for example, learns a lot of duplicate topics um, and it's also focus on high frequency words prevents it from learning anything really too interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I think, yeah, so, I mean, it definitely helps it, uh, that's like what it, it does uh, when you train it without it, but um, obviously for us, we wanted interpretability, and it's hard to get that when you have five different sadness uh, states, so, yeah. Okay, great. So, um, the last, oh, yeah. Yeah, so the relationship matrix, the di dictionary matrix is globally shared across all of the um, uh, relationships in the data set. Yeah. Okay, so the last part I want to mention about this project is that um, we also evaluate the trajectories. Um, so right now I've just been talking about the, the states. Um, but uh, just one quick example is that we know our Arthur and Lucy relationship looks something like marriage to sickness to death to murder, so this like, downfall of the relationship. So what do these models actually produce? Um, you can see the RMN model, the bottom left here. It starts off with boats, which is um, not at all relevant, but then switches to love and sadness and suffering to murder. So it's not perfect by any means, but um, there's a lot of things like politics and outdoors thrown in there, but it's doing a fairly reasonable job of sticking to what we know about the ground truth, uh, how this relationship works. Um, our topic model, on the other hand, is stuck in this love state throughout the relationship and it totally ignores the whole uh, evil vampire transformation and murder at the end. Um, so it's not very useful. Um, and we ran this more general experiment where um, we asked these uh, crowdsourced workers to judge which trajectory better matched the, uh, uh, a plot summary of the book. And um, over 70% of the time, they preferred uh, the RMN model. So it's very hard to evaluate these things. But um, you can see, at least here, that uh, the RMN is definitely doing a more reason. Yeah. Right. So, that's right. So that's why we have things like politics and outdoors, which maybe. That's right. It's then a lot of it could be attributed to co-reference errors and things like where we have a spin, where we shouldn't have a spin, and maybe this is um, yeah. So yeah. This is kind of a detail, but your example makes me worried that there might be systematic differences between the models that affect people's judgment. So specifically here, right, the number of states is a lot smaller in the, in the HTMM. Let's just say that Turkers prefer more fine-grained models and that on average, right, the number of states in the RMN is, you know, three times as much. Uh, it may be that they're... I see. So, so we train the topic model with the same number of states that or topics that the RMN gets. So I think what you're referring to is the how willing the model is to choose a different state at each. Well, I, I guess I'm I'm uh, saying that there are two factors. 
In the sure. Turker evaluation, it seems like there are two factors that are confounded or, or sure. you know, co potentially correlated, and you, there would be a way statistically to tease them apart by controlling for the number. So one thing is I see. you get the states right, right, like outdoors or boats is probably wrong, right. but murder is right. Another one is just uh, that they, they, on average, tend to prefer I see. Uh, models with more states. Yeah, that's a great so point. One simple um, question is, What's the average number of states in the HTMM? Yeah, so the HTMM, um, it's not usually like this. Um, usually they're about comparable in the number of states that they choose. This, uh, um, yeah, I think just in this example it was. Um, but yeah, we have uh, the reverse example a lot as well, too. So, yeah. No, but that's a, we probably should have done that. Oh, yeah, that, that's a good idea. <laughs> we didn't try any of these things. But. Sorry, and one more question. Sure. Maybe you'll get to it. But it, it seems like another way to think about this, right, is that the HTMM is a local maximum in the space of some large sure. space of statistical methods. You could try, you know, LDA based right. uh, topic models, et cetera. And, and likewise with the RMN, although you showed that it was no worse than a bunch of other ones. Right. But fundamentally, so given that you have two local maxima, it seems like an interesting question is, what what can you say about that difference, right? I, I don't think you can say. I see. Right, so basically. You so mean just you, looking at like maybe the first span here and why they differ or? Right, no, let, let me ask the question more sure. simply. Why is the RMN better? Right, so that, that's a great question. One One answer is because it actually has access to more information than the topic model does in the form of these word embeddings that it's initialized with. And so we see that is really improving its coherence of the states and um, also probably helping with um, learning more emotional um, descriptions, um, which we um, sort of bias it towards maybe with our penalty against um, learning similar states. Um, so that's one pretty huge reason. And people who've worked on these neural topic models have also found that um, just adding word embeddings into the model to represent words has a huge impact on the interpretability of topics. Um, the second reason is that um, we have, I guess, a much smoother or much more fine-grained control over how smooth these trajectories are versus in the, the HTMM. It also considers the sequence, but um, it has just like a single parameter that you tune and it doesn't really make a big difference, whatever you set it as. Um, whereas in, in our case, we have this, uh, and I didn't really go, go into detail on it, but our uh, recurrent update equation um, is basically interpolating between the previous state and the current state. Uh, using a learned uh, um, interpolation weight. So it may decide that, oh, this, this span isn't really different than the previous one. I should just copy over the previous thing. And so um, you can actually see if you, here I've just shown the argmax at each span, but if you look at the actual full distributions, it um, becomes very apparent the topic model is basically probability one choosing a topic and probability zero all of the others. But um, the RMN is, has much more mass distributed among the different states. So I think there are a lot of different factors at play. But yeah, we're not actually sure, I guess. Yeah, OK. So uh, I'll jump then to the um, next part. OK. Um, I'll try and go faster. <laughs> um, so here we're looking at comic books. And so comic books have um, obviously both artwork as well as text in the form of dialogue. Um, so we're switching gears here instead of focusing on characters like we did before. We're now focusing on the inferences that readers make when they're trying to understand a comic book narrative. So I just wanted to give an example of um, what this sort of inference looks in. OK, maybe I'll actually skip this. Um, OK, so uh, we'll get to just the, the comic example. So here I have two panels. Um, on the left, uh, you see these two men are conversing. They're debating whether or not to blow up a roadblock. And on the right, we see a big explosion. Um, so to understand what is causing this explosion and what is actually exploding, I have to have made sense of what these two uh, characters were talking about here. Um, but I also have to make a bunch of other inferences. So for example, um, how much time passed between these two panels? Probably not that much. The soldiers probably just had enough time to set up these charges, charges and get to cover and um, explode them. 
Um, we also may infer that um, the two men talking on the left are the leaders of the group that's shown here on the right. Um, and yeah, we may also infer that the one on the left is the leader because he's making the decision, um, and so on and so on. We can make all sorts of inferences to make sense of these just two panels. Um, and so people um, actually do research on comic books, and there's a term for this process. Um, in humans, it's called closure. Um, it's the way in which we make inferences, though both common sense based, using world knowledge to um, make sense of two panels that may be wildly different in terms of time and space. So our goal here is to study closure um, using deep neural networks to see how close we can get to human ability on um, comic understanding. So I'll just briefly go over our data set. Um, we uh, take a bunch of public domain comic books and extract panels and dialog boxes from the uh, raw JPEG images of the page. Um, then we run OCR on the text boxes. So we have a pretty huge data set of uh, 1.2 million panels and 2.5 million text boxes. Um, so definitely big enough to train some sort of deep network. Um, OK, so I will skip ahead then to the, uh, how the task looks. So um, to study uh, inference, we use this uh, closed style framework, which is popular in linguistics. So basically, I give you some context and ask you to predict some aspect of what immediately follows this context. So here I have these three panels. This is from an old um, Alice in Wonderland comic. So here, Alice and her friend are riding around on some cloud type vehicles um, that are powered by sprinklers. And Alice's cloud malfunctions, so uh, her friend gets out safely, but Alice crashes into this building. So this is our context. Now the task is, given the panel that immediately follows this context, um, can I predict what goes into this dialog box, the blacked out box there, out of these set of um, candidate dialogues? So um, the correct answer here is uh, C. Um, but you'll notice that in candidate A, we actually have a named entity, Alice, um, which is uh, directly relevant to this context. So that's what makes this task difficult, is that the candidates here come from adjacent pages of the comic book. So we would expect them to mention the same entities, um, maybe even the same plot points. And so we really need to do a good job of understanding the context in order to um, select the correct candidate. OK, so I can get to our model now. Um, if we look at our same example, here we basically have this hierarchical neural network architecture where um, I have one level of the network that's looking just at the dialogue, um, processing the text, and um, integrating this with the artwork of that panel into a single panel level representation. And then the second level goes across panels to integrate all of the panel representations together into just a single representation that I can then use to score my uh, dialogue candidates. So how this works is, um, well, it's a pretty standard um, LSTM mixed with CNN. Um, we actually have to use uh, multiple LSTMs to encode the conversation flow within a single panel. Um, and our visual features, um, we experiment with a bunch of different things. Um, the reported results here all use a pre-trained ImageNet model, which we then fine-tune on our task. Um, so here's the second level representation, another LSTM that goes across panels to um, integrate all these panel representations. And then we use the final hidden state of the LSTM to score all of our candidates. Um, but just before I get to the results, I wanted to mention that um, paintings are, or sorry, comics are very different than ImageNet. Um, they have lots of stylistic variation that's not present in photographs. So here we have a bunch of lines. The ones on the left are from humor comics. So you can see that they sort of have human expressions, um, whereas the ones on the right are from action adventure comics and look more realistic, or at least are supposed to look more realistic. Um, so one thing that we're currently in the process of trying is instead of using an image net network um, to extract visual features, why don't we use this colorization network, um, which is more uh, domain specific, so we can actually train it on our own data. Basically, you take a grayscale image of the comic uh, panel, and you try and reproduce the colorized version. 
And so in this process of learning to colorize, if I want, say, for example, I have an apple and I want to know that the apple should be red, I actually need to understand that this is an apple and I need to know that um, there are certain properties of an apple that make it red. Um, and so this is a very powerful feature extractor. Um, so the results I report here are from an ImageNet network, but we're seeing um, actual performance increases using this as our visual extractor. OK, so the conclusion is that closure is difficult. Um, so if you look at a random baseline here, there are three candidates, so you have a 33% chance of getting the correct answer. If we look at the model I showed before, but, um, oh, uh, but we remove the dialogue, so we can only look at the images, um, we don't do much better than random. Um, we see a similar thing when we remove the images and just look at the dialogue. But when we incorporate both of them, we see a pretty big boost to about 12% absolute accuracy. So we're getting about 63% of these uh, closed uh, examples correct. Um, but the problem is that when we give humans the same task with the exact same input, um, they get, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> they get 84% of the uh, um, closed style examples correct. So um, just briefly, um, what makes this difference? Um, and we find that um, while we do have a lot of data, there's a lot of examples of the things that our model gets wrong where uh, it's required to make some sort of inference that uh, we regard as common sense. Like for example, a man may be getting into a car at one panel and a man in, in the next panel you see a zoomed out shot of a car driving down a highway. You need to recognize that this is the same car and that the man from the first panel is now in this car. Um, but the sort of camera angle changes, the exaggeration of size differences um, makes this very, very difficult to have this consistency and sort of um, map the, the character's movements through the context. Um, so we're basically focusing on improving our visual feature um, recognition system, um, doing some annotations there and seeing if we can add external knowledge from databases like Visual Genome, which have a lot of uh, annotated information that obviously they're not in comics, but they could still potentially help us uh, get around problems like these. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we did. I, I didn't show that here. Um, so it actually helps um, not as much as you would hope, but uh, I think if we remove the history in our image text model, we get maybe 5 or 6% accuracy worse. Um, so it is the case that you can do a lot of these predictions without the context information. Um, but in, all, in the examples that it gets wrong, in most of the cases, you need to have understood the context. Like there may be some candidate that you can't just uh, disambiguate from a single image alone. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I have like five minutes. <laughs> I will try and rush through this. Uh, actually, maybe I'll just talk about. Um, so, okay, so all of the work I've talked about up till this point has uh, been on understanding contexts and creative domains. Um, but I hope to um, sort of expand into, take the next step to generating language conditioned on our understanding of these complicated contexts. Um, okay, so I wanted to frame this in um, the sort of conversational setting where uh, we have a chatbot or something like Alexa or Google Home, which is able to, uh, right now, is capable of uh, <laughs> um, Basically, single-turn, goal-oriented dialogue is what they're built for. So if I ask Alexa how much protein is in an egg, um, this is a fairly simple question. Um, but it really has no understanding of the context. It has no knowledge of the interaction history um, between the agent and the user and how it should use this history to um, change what it's generating. Um, so just as an example of the short, immediate short-term context and how this can trip up the systems, um, and this is more in the question answering line of work, um, even asking follow-ups like in how many carbs where the subject is implicit, um, it's from the previous question, can trip up these systems. Um, so they're not doing well at immediate short-term context, let alone long-term discourse level context. Um, but just to briefly expand on this, um, 
over the summer at MSR, I worked on this problem of answering sequences of questions, um, which I think may be interesting here, um, where we have this knowledge base, which in this case is this table. Um, and what we're trying to do is answer uh, a sequence of questions, which uh, contain a lot of dependencies between uh, questions in the sequence. So I might have which nations competed in this water polo cup, and this is easy to answer with just a select, um, select the column. But I may have a follow-up question then, like of these nations, which ones won at least one gold medal? And now you see that um, this these nations in the second question refers to the answer of the previous question. So it's a sort of interesting modification of the standard semantic parsing problem where we have to add these additional operators to get, um, get this to work on follow-up questions. Um, so this is uh, just a sort of detour. Um, but well, um, what I'm really interested in is um, how discourse level context affects um, language generation and these dialogue agents. So if we're looking at non-goal oriented dialogue, um, we want our agent to be able to um, model their user um, both in terms of like their beliefs, how they interact with other humans, um, and adapt the, the, the agent should adapt its responses based on its understanding of the user, which is growing uh, as the interaction history grows. Um, so I'll skip this, although it is important. And maybe I'll conclude with uh, just an example of what I mean here by um, leveraging this discourse context. Um, so here we have our Arthur and Lucy example again for a final time. Um, and what I mean is that we actually have now some understanding, a very high level understanding of how this relationship is at different points in time. So if I treat this as a language generation problem where I look at all the dialogue between Arthur and Lucy in the book and I here treat um, Lucy as a human user and Arthur as the agent, we can see how the context really affects the way in which uh, Arthur should respond to Lucy. So here. Um, in the love state, they're about to get married, and Lucy says to Arthur, I love you more than ever. And so now the agent should recognize that, okay, I'm in a positive state. Um, I shouldn't respond negatively to this statement. I shouldn't say, I don't love you, you're an evil vampire, because she's not an evil vampire yet. So um, in the book, we have the ground truth dialogue. We know that Arthur says, you make me very, very happy. I don't know what I've done to deserve it. Um, now, if you compare this to the point in their relationship where Lucy has turned into an evil vampire and they're in the suffering state, um, she makes a similar sort of positive uh, utterance, come to me, Arthur, leave these others and come to me. Um, but here, it would be totally inappropriate for Arthur to respond positively, having seen the evil vampire version of Lucy, right? So um, in the book, uh, Arthur says, is this really your body? You're only a e demon in your shape. Um, so we can see that he obviously did not respond in the same way. And what I mean is that we should make these dialogue agents um, basically aware of the high level context and how this is influencing um, the conversation. Obviously in fictional relationships, this is very exaggerated, They're <laughs> like vampires. Um, but um, uh, it's a good test bed for this sort of model because we have a lot of dialogue in creative texts like novels and plays, but we also have a lot of contextual description of properties of characters, how different events are happening, and how we should model, how we should build our model to be able to um, extract information and use it to um, update our dialogue generation parameters. So I guess I'll just conclude with that because I think I'm out of time. So yeah. Thank you.